to, to um, speak for the SIAM student chapter at FAU. Uh, and thanks to the officers of the student chapter for um, the invitation and uh, for organizing this talk. Um, so I'm just going to let you jump in whenever you're ready and tell us a little bit about relocation strategies and uh, anything else you want to tell us about um, uh, uh, nonlinear PDEs. Sure. Take it away. Thank you. Can you guys see this? And you know what? I'm, I might not go into full screen because otherwise I can't see you. Uh, so is this okay? It's great. So my my title changed a little bit. Um, I, you know, I'm, it's still a story about the ideal free distribution, but uh, I think more concretely, what I want to talk about is sort of the effect of directed movement on the strong Ali effect. Okay. Um, and let me let me thank you guys for, for the opportunity to speak to you guys today about some of the work that, that I've been working on recently. Uh, okay. So uh, here's sort of a quick outline. So I will motivate uh, the, the research and the study that we do. Uh, I'll introduce some important concepts. Um, and then we'll talk about whether a population can overcome an Ali effect. So I'll tell you what an Ali effect is and I'll tell you what I mean by overcoming it. Okay, and then we're going to talk about competition, right, um, in the context of populations that are subject to an Ali effect. Uh, and then we'll talk about the Cauchy problem. So I'm first going to address this on a bounded domain, and then I'm going to move on to a, um, the evolution equation on the entire space, okay, um, on our end. Okay. So let's talk about movement, right? Movement of an organism is key to the survival of a species, right? We know that animals need to forage for food. They need to run away from predators, expand their territories. And of course, I'm at TU, so I have to show some buffs roaming around. Um, and I really like the, the image down here where you have, you know, sort of this interface between humans and wildlife. And so you can see that understanding the effect that of certain environments, that we are changing has an effect on the movement and the survival of, of many, many wild species, okay? I also think that, uh, I like to think also in the context of social applications. Uh, and so I wanna sort of provide a general framework, not just for species and ecology, but also I think companies, for example, have to make strategic decisions on how to place the stores in order for their species to be to, 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 or for their stores to be successful, okay? Um, our, our objective, again, is to study the role of movement on populations that are subject to, to the Ali effect. And so let me tell you what the Ali effect is. So the Ali effect uh, was first observed here by Professor Ali, who was studying uh, goldfish um, and, and their sort of survivals depending on, on size of, of, of the fish. And basically he, he noted, you know, that there's some species that sort of decline, there's a decline in individual fitness at population sizes or, of, or densities. Um, and this could be due to mating systems, predations, uh, predation, environmental modification. So social interactions is a huge one. Um, so for example, um, a species that is known to be subject to an Ali effect are, there, are the prairie dogs, which are very, very social species. And they communicate about predators at high densities. But at low densities, that communication network breaks down. And so then predators can come in and the population is, is um, likely to go extinct, okay? And so of course the consequences are that you have a decline of a population at low densities, sometimes unpredicted collapses of many exploited species, such, such as a passenger pigeon, which sort of disappeared and people didn't know why. And it turns out that due to hunting and, and their social reduction, like the, the population was brought down to such a low level uh, that again, their social system broke, broke down, okay? Um, the, let me just sort of share how I started thinking about this problem. Um, again, my colleagues and I like to think about sort of the connections between ecology and social applications. And we were, you know, one of my colleagues was mentioning how coffee shops and shoe shorts have to be placed very differently 
right? We want to go to a coffee shop that's close by, but we don't care whether the shoe store is close by as long as they're clustered, as long as we can go to many of them, right? That's why we have malls. Uh, and so in a way you have these retail stores and that are also subject to an elite effect, right? That's why we have car dealerships that are all clustered. They're competing, but yet they're in the same, you know, they're, they're sort of in the same locations. And most, most interesting to me are industrial clusters. I'm working with an economist from China who basically asked the same question a few years ago. Why are these competing factories clustered together, right? And so we're trying to develop some, some models. Um, you know, they have some theories and we're trying to develop some mathematical models related um, to, to that to try to understand when clusters will be successful versus when they will, you know, um, the fail, which does happen. Okay, all right. So now that we understand the Ali effect, let's talk about movement strategies, okay? So in ecology, classically spatially explicit populations typically are, are modeled using simple diffusion, right? So you assume that a population moves randomly or you know, individuals move, follow a Brownian motion. And then as you take the number of individuals to infinity, if you're looking at the time evolution of the population density, right, you, ed you end up with the classical, classical diffusion, right? But there's been recent interest in models that include some sort of bias movement, right? And there are really two, two types of bias movements. One is physical advection, specifically in rivers. And these are typically unidirectional directional, um, and affect all populations in a similar way, but most importantly, they do not involve behavior of the population, right? The population's kind of being, it's being pushed. The second type of bias movement is this taxes on the environmental gradient, okay? So you have, imagine that you have some sort of, I call it a signal, right? Like a population maybe is following a signal. They maybe are moving up gradients of, of the resources, for example. So this is a taxes on the environmental gradient. These are the types of movements that I'm interested in, okay? The, those are our interests is populations moving with a combination of some um, passive diffusion, but also a taxes on, on an environment, okay? Uh, okay, and again, really the most popular form of population dynamics uses, you know, reaction advection diffusion with logistic growth. It is much, much easier to analyze logistic growth. And I'll briefly tell you about why the Ali effect brings in uh, many analytical complications, okay? Uh, let me just, you know, also talk about sort of the difference between unconditional and conditional dispersal. This, this was notation, um, notions introduced by McPeak and Holt, where again, unconditional dispersal, again, is independent of the environment or, or the population density, and conditional is dependent on the environment and or the population. We want a combination of both of these, okay? Okay, so again, our framework are gonna be reaction advection diffusion equations, which have been heavily used to gain insight into spatial ecology. Really since Skellum's uh, you know, seminal 1951 paper relating random walks to the heat equation, okay? Okay, we know Einstein did that before, but this is in the context of ecology, okay? Uh, and really since then, the development of reaction advection diffusion theory has gone hand in hand with further understanding of, of you know, ecological system, especially again, spatial ecology. Um, these types of equations have also gained interest um, in social phenomena to try to understand. I personally have worked on urban crimes, gang dynamics, rioting activity, so on and so forth, okay? I should say that this framework is not the right framework for uh, most retail stores. They do not move locally, but they are, they could be suitable for you know, street vendors, uh, mobile pastoralites, you know, which are, you know, there are many in, in, in Africa, for example. Um, so let me just say street vendors, you might say, okay, well, that's a very narrow application, but in fact, street vendors are a very important sector of many informal economies. I'm from Mexico and I know that there are street vendors in every corner. Uh, well, even in the US, if you go to a, a Mexican neighborhood, you will see street vendors walking around the neighborhoods, right? So 
this sort of framework would be suitable for, for, for those. And I will talk about this in relation to the ideal free distribution, which has been studied for children selling water in Istanbul. Okay. Um, so, you know, so basically what I'm trying to say is this is a framework that can apply beyond ecology. Okay. So let me talk about uh, where these types of questions come from historically. Okay. Um, really, this started, you know, this type of analysis started with Hastings in 1983. And basically, he, he uh, looked at exotic species are species that are rare, they're small. Um, in, again, spatially varying but temporally constant environments, basically he was able to show that they can invade if and only if their dispersal is smaller than the resident population. And I'll tell you the simple mathematical idea behind this in a second, okay, just because this is where this all started. And this has generated, and, and all really, all of these type of work has really been focused on logistic growth. Okay, this is logistic growth here. Dougherty and I'll sort of generalized that in 1998. Um, later on, people tried to, people studied spatially varying and temporally varying environments. And in that case, faster diffusion sometimes is actually better. Um, and then there's been some work looking at conditional uh, dispersal. And basically, you know, people have been able to show that moving a bias movement can actually increase persistence okay all in the context of logistic growth okay uh, the conditional di dispersal again is, is the passive motion or diffusion plus movement up gradients of, of a resource which is what we're going to be um, thinking about okay so let me just briefly discuss hastings 1983 paper because it started everything so again, his question was, can spatial variation alone lead to selection for increased dispersal? So here's the population, you know, a capital N. This F, the only condition again, is that it has a stable non-constant equilibrium. So think of, you know, think of logistic equation, okay? Um, and so imagine that this population is established at this non-constant equilibrium, right? It's at an equilibrium. The question is, if I introduce another population, little n, that's small, can it establish itself, right? And really this boils down to answering the question about stability of now um, n is, you know, n is equal to zero placing the population in the context in, you know, uh, of the, the capital M, N population being established, okay? And it turns out that basically N is equal to zero is locally asymptotically stable if D is bigger, if little d, right, which is the population, the, the dispersal rate of the new population is faster than the original, okay? And it's unstable if D, and so it's able to invade, right, in only if, if spreading speed is smaller, okay? So it's quite a simple idea. Um, of course, you can talk about other ways that a movement, you know, that a strategy can be, can, 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 can be good. But in this age, basically it's saying like, slower dispersal tends to be a better strategy if once a population is established, okay? We'll talk more about this in a second. So let me just sort of write down the framework, right? So for us, U is going to represent some population density, right? Street vendors, buff, you know, um, D is going to be our domain. I'm going to say I'm going to start with a bounded domain, um, and then move on to the Cauchy problem. And again, I'm going to focus on on a local framework. So here's here's my simple equation, right? Here's my movement strategy, and he, I'm go, F is going to include my Ali effect. Here are my boundary conditions. Now, there are many, many movement strategies. Um, and in particular, um, I mean, I've, we've done some work on these non-local ones. But today, what I'm going to talk about is this, this local passive and directed movement. So again, random motion, right? Brownian motion here, plus this advected, I'm affecting the population, up gradients of some signal. 
okay? Okay, so again, the, the questions that I want to ask is, are there rearrangement mechanisms that could help overcome the Ali effect and what happens under competition? Okay, so let me tell you what I mean, but can we overcome the Ali effect? Let me just start with the classical reaction diffusion equation, okay? Uh, and so here, the two prototypical reaction terms are, again, are the logistic growth, known as monostable, this should be negative and negative. Um, and if you forget about diffusion, okay, let's just remember ODEs, okay? If my population starts below, between zero and one, it's going to increase to one, okay? If it starts below or above one, since this is negative, it's gonna to decrease to one. So one is a stable equilibrium. Zero is an unstable equilibrium, okay? Now, if you add diffusion, things get a little bit more complicated, but not that much more. Basically, depending on the, if your domain is sufficiently large, okay, your population will survive, you know? Um, or you could put a little diffusion coefficient here, and if you're, you know, depending on, on, on the diffusion, you, you know, it's one of the two. You can vary the domain side, you can vary the, the diffusion, okay? Um, okay. The other one, if I want to model the Ali effect, we end up with this bistable equation. So the dynamics even of the ODE are more complicated, right? So if I start between, this is the Ali threshold. Uh, if I start between the Ali threshold and the carrying capacity, I grow. But if I start below it, I decay, OK? Now, if I add diffusion, now it's a spatial problem. It's a little bit more complicated, right? But if you start with a constant initial data, it behaves the same as the ODE. The, the interesting part becomes, what about initial data where parts of it are below the elite threshold and parts are above, okay? And so you can see that the, the, the dynamics become really, really complicated. What people have done is basically, if you look at this in RN, um, you look at a characteristic equation. Basically, how large does that characteristic equation have to be in order for the population to survive? And really, it was only until, you know, maybe definitely the past decade that people were able to show that there is a sharp critical threshold uh, and what happens with a sharp critical threshold. People knew that if, if, if you know, the, you had a characteristic equation on a set that was sufficiently large, the population would survive. But the critical threshold was, again, something that people were not able to show rigorously until very, very recently, okay? So the dynamics here are a lot more interesting, shall I say. Okay, um, just a few more words differentiating the, the, the Fisher KPP, that's a logistic equation, right? Again, I, I mentioned the, the Dirichlet problem. Uh, basically, you have an existence of a non-trivial equilibrium solution and U0, if U0 is unstable. It, you know, it all boils down to the stability of u is equal to zero. And the dynamics of the evolution problem depend on the stability of u is equal to zero. For the Neumann problem, u is equal to m is always stable, okay? The bistable equation, um, I, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna say this again, but I mentioned sort of the, the dynamics. To keep things simple, I'm first going to focus on constant initial data, okay? So I know that we have, that we have constant initial data. Oh, let me, well, uh, I have constant initial data um, that if I'm below the elite threshold, I'm, my population is going to go, go extinct. The question is, can I move, can the population move in a way to overcome that? So even if you start with the initial population below the elite threshold, can you overcome that? Okay. Um, how are we going to do that, right? So we're going to introduce this bias movement. Think of chi as my speed, A is my signal. Here I'm just sort of, I need, I need some conditions of, on my growth functions. I need some conditions on my, on, my, um, on my signal, but let's not worry about that so much, okay? And basically these elite threshold can, can vary, right? The spatially, there's no reason why we need this to be sort of constant. It could be generalized. Okay, and you know, just to just to say that we have these, you know, admissible signals, we have, you know, admissible admissible growth patterns, you know, think of think of 
the 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 type of you know this this function here as sort of our classical case where m represents the resources and theta the elite threshold okay okay so uh, he, i already said this but basically i want initial i want to see if there's a chi and an a so that if my initial population starts below theta my population u of x t approaches a non-trivial equilibrium solution as t approaches infinity okay and so before we answer that let you know we need to we need to um try to understand the system a little bit more right um so actually we have a a, a change of variables that really is kind of handy because it gives us this new system where we clearly have a maximum and comparison principle for admissible signals A, okay? So we have, we can work with super and sub solutions in, in this case, which is very handy. If you don't know what a super solution is, it's basically, um, it's going to be a function that does not have to satisfy equality, but the time derivative has to be bigger than or equal to than the, the operator, the spatial operator, okay? And of course, and you need you you have to satisfy this you know the boundary condition with with sort of the right equality a sub solution you just change the sign but the beautiful thing about these solutions is that essentially if you start off with a sub solution you know you're going to be increasing okay and if you start off with the super solution you're going to be you're going to be decreasing so it can give us information about you know solutions you know actually proving that solutions exist okay that satisfy certain properties um and you know we also need to talk about whether there is a solution right whether it's unique uh so that we're actually talking about dynamics of something that is well posed okay so in fact i mean we can show that there are uniform bounds on the on any equilibrium solution um, and of course, then classical theory for uniformly elliptic equations provide a C2 um, solution if, if, even if your initial data is in L infinity, right? So you don't have to be continuous. Um, and, you know, we can then prove some, some you know, non-negativity of U and, and uh, this bound, uh, which basically then allows me to extend my local and time solution to a global solution, okay? So it's a well-posed problem in, in this case for the signals that I, you know, that's why I told you I need some conditions on, on, on my signals, okay? And it also has a free energy. So let me just show you what this free energy is. So what does that mean? It means that if V is a solution to that modified equation, the energy decreases, right? As, as as T increases and your, your solution evolves, this energy decreases. So if you just take the time derivative of this, you see that it, it decreases with time. So what does that buy me? It buys me that an equilibrium, um, a minimizer of F is an equilibrium solution of my original problem, okay? So this variational formulation is actually quite, quite useful. Um, so the first thing that we show is basically we want to understand what equilibrium when we have equilibrium solutions that are non-trivial and we first look at the Dirichlet problem uh, and in fact for a and f admissible if mu is sufficiently small we have two positive equilibrium solutions okay um let me just say that you know what you do is you work in this hilbert space with this weighted inner product that comes from 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 our uh, on our equation and our boundary conditions they're directionally boundary conditions you sh you show a sort of compactness condition and then use a mountain pass theorem okay so those are the the analysis tools that that go into it of course you need to show that there is some function where this is less than zero otherwise u is zero would be a minimizer and that would be boring right we can do that right um here i'm just sort of uh, I'm, I'm i'm just sort of showing that the the bounds that we that we get just simply telling you that chi should sort of come into play but for this estimate it really doesn't because it it it's both in the term that helps us but in the term that hurts us okay so so we can actually uh, I think there's room to improve these types of estimates where we take advantage of chi. Okay, we can do the same thing now for the no flux problem, which is really the one we're interested in. 
The only thing that changes, of course, now we have different boundary conditions. So we have a different inner product, okay? Um, and then the mound pass theorem only applies under the condition that the diffusion is smaller, sufficiently small, okay? So it's less general, okay? So that's just sort of the, the stationary problem. But we're interested about in the time evolution, okay? So what we can show is that if chi is sufficiently small, so that if your bias movement is sufficiently small, then essentially your problems in the long term are going to behave similarly to the classical diffusion problem, okay? So in this case, you cannot overcome the LE effect, okay? Um, so again, small effect, uh, small speed is, is, is not gonna help, be helpful. Um, Again, here we just use super, super, and you, you have to just find suitable super and sub solutions. So let me, let me not go into that detail. For chi general though, uh, what does happen, even if chi is small or large, the local in time behavior of the system is different, right? So here we're, we can show that um, this is a set where basically uh, A, it's above its average. Think about it that way, okay? So that's where A is, is large, okay? So in this set, if we start with initial condition that's less than theta, so I have here one minus epsilon times theta, there is a time T star where the population o is above the elite threshold precisely in this set. So what happens is that initially it, you know, even if it's below, it concentrates around the areas where, where A is, um, where A is large at the maximum of A, okay? But, you know, again, this is independent of chi. Chi can be really small, okay? So we know that in the long term, I, we already showed that in the long term, that's still going to decay to zero, right? Um, so this does not really take, advantage of, of A or chi, okay? So again, there's always some initial growth, but it does not imply that you will persist um, in the long term. Let me just show you some numerical results, right? So here is here is my, my equation. Here's my signal, right? So the population wants to move up, you know, it wants to be up here. My elite threshold is 0.3. My initial data is 0.2, okay? So I'm below the elite threshold. Um, Okay, if chi is one, you could see that at t is equal to zero, I'm above the elite threshold, but at t is 500, it's decaying. This is approaching zero. It might not seem like it, but that's basically zero, okay? But if chi is five, here's what happens at t is equal to 10, and here is the long-term equilibrium solution. It actually survives, right? So in fact, we do have this case where, again, we are overcoming the Ali effect, even though we started below the, uh, the Ali threshold, okay? And in general, what, well, what we conjecture and what we can prove in the Cauchy problem, but not in the bounded domain case. Uh, so for the bounded domain case, this is simply a conjecture that no matter what constant initial data, there's always a chi that will help, it o help overcome that Ali effect, right? So here, uh, my initial U is right here. Chi is 0.2. It's not enough for the population to survive. But chi 3, actually, the final U is blue here. And, and A is in yellow here. I can even take a smaller initial data, 0.01. And chi 50, the population does not survive. But chi 100, the population actually does survive. OK? Um, but basically, uh, this is just a conjecture because the boundary conditions are really problematic. Um, and so in terms of finding suitable super and sub solutions uh, that, uh, it, it, that you have to deal with changes of concavity and then you have to deal with the boundary conditions and those tend to be sort of contradictory. Um, and so that's been problematic. So we skirt that issue by working on unbounded domains but of course, you, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You, you have to pay a price for working on unbounded domains, but I'll, I'll get to that in, in, in a second. Um, but let me just say that, you know, moving, if you have one population, moving fast seems to be a good thing, okay? Moving, you know, kind of being greedy seems to be a good thing here to help the population. 
So I want to talk a little bit about just sticking with the bounded domain, finishing the story is what happens under competition, right? So imagine that you have two populations that have the same resources that are similar in everything, except their movement strategy. Okay, so here's M and MV are different movement strategies. So, you know, what's interesting again about the system is that it's cooperative at low densities. Okay, so if you are both below the elite threshold, it is useful for the two populations to cooperate. And then once they become the above, the go above the elite threshold, then they want to outcompete each other, right? So it's cooperative at low densities, competitive at high densities, which is what makes this analysis really, really, really hard. Okay. Um, so this could be sort of give you an idea of sort of what a good strategy might be. Um, so again, we want to compare strategies. So how can we determine what strategies are good? Well, sort of taking ideas from, from evolutionary game theory, we can try to think about evolutionarily stable strategies, right? Again, the movement is our strategy and you know, our game is we want to outcompete, right? That's, that's how we win. So an evolutionary, evolutionarily stable strategy is a strategy which if adopted by a population leads to a population being able to resist invasions by an, an alternative population of its rare, okay? Re related but different is this neighborhood invader strategy. This is one strategy that can invade other populations using other strategies to replace them, okay? And again, these are important ideas uh, coming from behavioral ecology, evolutionary psychology, economics. Um, now, a lot of times the strategies that lead to evolutionarily stable strategies are those to, that lead to an ideal free distribution. The, so that's why I said this is a story about the ideal free distribution. So what is an ideal free distribution? A good movement strategy might lead a population to match its resources, right? You, you want U is equal to M in the long run, okay? So an ideal free distribution is basically how individuals would move if they were free to move in order to optimize their resources, provided they had ideal knowledge of the environment and, and they were free to move as they wanted, right? In that case, you expect the population's distribution to match the resources, okay? So, you know, think, think two patches, one has twice as many resources, you expect twice as much population in that patch than, than, than in the other patch, okay? Um, so in this case, let me just say that there is evidence of the ideal free distribution, both experimentally and in observational evidence. So for example, experimentally, social spiders, uh, basically it's, you know, been found that the areas with smaller insects have smaller communities. Okay, bumblebees distribute themselves proportionally based on plant density. Okay, what about observational evidence? Uh, it's been observed that children selling water in Istanbul, their density actually matches the number of cars passing by. Okay, so it is something that we see in, 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 in real life. Pastorialites also um, tend to distribute themselves proportionally to the quality and quantity of, of the resources. Um, for, for their herds, okay? So we do see these things. So the question is what sort of movements lead to these uh, ideal free distributions, okay? Um, and so in the context of, of the Ali effect, let me just mention that the resources is independent of the signal, right? They, you know, A and M do not have to be related. But perhaps if we want U to equal M, you should be moving up gradients of the resources. That would be, that would be a reasonable thing to, to do. Um, and it turns out that that doesn't really lead to an ideal free distribution. You need to move up gradients of the natural log of the resources with a particular speed, chi is equal to one. So if you're too greedy, you will not reach an ideal free distribution, right? And when you take chi is equal to one, you could just check that the u is equal to m is an equilibrium, and we can check, right, that it's a stable, linearly stable equilibrium solution, okay? So is it a good strategy? Okay, so first let me show you some, a quick computation where we have two populations 
you again uh, is moving with this ideal, I call this an ideal free distribution strategy. That's when you have an equilibrium that matches the resources that is stable. And V is just a little bit more greedy. It's gonna move up the resources a little bit faster, which you might think is a good strategy. You wanna to get to the top first, right? But turns out that even though V starts with higher resources, a lot higher, one versus 0.05, you outcompetes by a lot, okay? So being too greedy is not good, right? Moving too slow also is not good, right? You have to sort of move, um, you know, definitely move up the gradients, but don't do it, don't do it too quickly, okay? So, okay, what can we say then theoretically, okay? Well, the first thing we wanna do is try to see if it's a neighborhood neighborhood invader invader strategy okay so here are my populations again i'm not going to generalize my movement for v a little bit okay S the only thing i need is that v to have a positive equilibrium but that's above the elite threshold and we can actually develop or, or discuss many many ways that that can happen Okay, so we have, you know, uh, many lemmas that tell you what movement strategies lead to an equilibrium solution that's stable, that's above the elite threshold. Okay, uh, and so let's see if V is established and U is rare, can it invade? And really that boils down to understanding the, the, the stability of zero V star, right? Because V star is established, you, you know, again, you we're going to be close to zero because it's rare. And if this is unstable, then you can invade. Okay. And so you basically just study the, um, the eigenvalue problem that comes out from linearizing our equation. Okay. And you do some change of variables um, and do some, some, you know, Manipulation integration by parts. I tell my students that I make my a living integrating by parts. Um, uh, this should be in here. And what we can show is that in fact the uh, principal eigenvalue has to be positive, right? So that means that zero v star is unstable, right? So in that case, we our population is going to is going to invade. Okay, now. In the logistic case, it is clear that this is the right strategy. The natural, that, you know, the ideal free distribution strategy is the best strategy. It's evolutionarily stable as well. In our case, it's not so clear because even if you're moving using this strategy, you need to have enough resources initially to actually reach that equilibrium solution, right? That ideal free distribution. So here, these populations are moving, are using the same strategy. Uh, here's my elite threshold. My, uh, my, if my initial density is right here, look, I, I am reaching a distribution, I'm surviving, but it's not the ideal free distribution. Same thing here. It's only until I have sufficiently high resources that my population actually matches the resources, okay? So even, using the, what we believe to be the best strategy um, doesn't always give you this ideal free distribution in, in, in this case. Not only that, the, we have to think about the, in, you know, sort of the basins of attractions, I guess, of, of these, of these uh, equilibrium solutions. There are some initial data where you might be better off moving down gradients of the elite threshold, okay? Uh, so here's sort of a case where I move down gradients of the elite threshold, my population survives. Here, I use the ideal free distribution strategy and my, po my population goes extinct, okay? So depending on your initial data, again, it's not clear what strategy is, 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 is the best. Now, of course, it depends on sort of the correlation between, between the signal and the, the um, if there's sort of a negative co correlation, then you know you could move up gradients of the resources, or you're going to be fine because you're moving away, you're moving to low areas of the elite threshold. But when you're positively correlated, like here, that's when it becomes sort of a question. So we still need to determine 
sort of the basin of attractions for, for the different equilibrium solutions in, in this case. Okay, so let me just say that we can show that the ideal free distribution is a local neighborhood invader. It, we have evidence that it is evolutionarily stable, but again, that it might not necessarily be the best strategy depending on the resources that you have. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting analysis that still needs to go there. Um, okay, um, I don't, let me just quickly tell you a little bit about the Cauchy problem, right? Because ultimately I do wanna answer the question of like, when, we, when can we overcome the LE effect? Okay, if, if we sort of give up the idea of working on a bounded domain, and now we're working on all of space, okay? We have to pay a price because now, now my coefficients are unbounded. And so the global existence theory is a little bit more complicated, but nevertheless, we, we have a global existence theory for the signals that we're interested in, okay? Um, but that's the price that we pay. If you have signals um, that basically aggregate the, the pool, the mass from infinity, then we can actually overcome the LE, the LE effect. Okay, so again, I'm starting below the LE threshold. Chi is, is small, then your population won't survive, but if, if, if it's sufficiently large, and that depends on A um, and, and, and your initial population, then you're, you will overcome the LE effect, okay? In, you know, in particular, you know, we were interested, we realized that, you know, uh, such, a, such an equation, the, the einstein ollenbeck process actually satisfies our conditions. So the Fokker-Planck equation is here and it's a very specific signal, right? So, so this is actually, the, this is a population that's moving randomly, but it's mean reverting. It has the tendency to also go back to sort of a central location. And in this case, actually, there, you know, this corresponds to our A being this minus some constant X squared over two. And in that case, actually we have a very sharp, we have a sharp result. There is a sharp threshold chi so that if you move above that threshold, your population actually does survive, okay? Um, so again, just sort of some key takeaways. In essence, what we have is an infinite source at, at infinity. And so these super harmonic signals are kind of pulling, are kind of pulling them in. But if also if you have sub harmonic signals, you can have sort of the, the, the opposite effect where a population would survive under classical diffusion, but will not survive because you're pushing the populations further away in, in that context. So that made us, you know, sort of tried to relate what we understand in, by the way, if you have the Cauchy problem for the classical reaction diffusion equation, the same thing will happen, right? If your population's below you, you will decay, right? So, you know, so you, you know, you are, you're not comparing apples to oranges in, 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 in that case. Um, but, you know, we realized that the same result that we had for the Cauchy problem uh, really, kind of would be the same if we had, instead of no flux boundary condition, if we had an influx of, of the population. So in a way, you know, we're kind of cheating, you know, is basically what we're, what, what, what we realize, even though for, you know, you can compare it to, to the classical reaction diffusion equation. So we decided we better compare it to the classical reaction diffusion uh, with an influx. And in that case, there are, conditions under which you can overcome the LE effect as well. Okay. Uh, and, you know, let me just finally end up because I want to leave, you know, 10 minutes for questions is that in that case as well, we also know that the uh, natural, um, that the IDF is an ideal, it's a neighborhood invader. Okay. So again, the proof is a little bit more complicated because you need to be able to do this integrals on an, un on an unbounded domain, right? Um, but basically you, you know, you can use characteristic functions, be able, you know, just uh, be, be able to prove that you can use like the monotone convergence theorems and, and it sort of works out. S under some conditions on, first of all, your resources has to be L1. And the, this is gonna be, um, you know, this is gonna be unstable to perturbations that satisfy some condition, 
Okay, so not for, you know, so the perturbations have to be sort of restricted and it depends on the resources as well. Okay. Okay, moving beyond local movement, we're starting to look at basically it seems that the strategies that are useful in overcoming the LA effect are strategies that actually aggregate the population, right? Um, and so a typical, a, a typical, um, I, I guess a very famous equation is the aggregation diffusion equation. I did some work on that when I was a grad student as well without the reaction term. And so the question is sort of what kernels actually can lead to, again, overcoming the LD effect, right? Because depending on the kernel, right? Even actually here, the global existence theory is quite intricate. It depends, you, you have this competition between random motion and aggregation. And if it depends on the singularity, if, if, if your kernel is very singular, you're gonna blow up. Um, but so there's some, some interesting analysis because you don't have comparison principles anymore. Okay, so you have to sort of look for invariant regions. Uh, and also moving on to more general applications, we wanna consider integral differential equations that model position jumps or, or birth, jump, birth jump processes, right? So um, in these cases, you, you can also see that they're ideal free distributions. And so you can try to figure out what strategies, again, um, you know, can lead to those and determine whether those are good. Okay, so just sort of some key takeaways, right? Competition can be good when you're overcoming the Ali effect. Uh, moving fast is good when you're alone, but moving too fast and being too greedy is bad when you're competing, okay? Um, we're thinking that maybe an optimal strategy is sort of a callous strategy, which where you cooperate at low densities to beat the elite threshold and then move uh, and then and then sort of outcompete, right? So so really we should be thinking about these time dependent movement strategies um, in, in in the future. Uh, okay, with that, let me thank my collaborators, Henri Beristiki, Chris Cosner, the NSF, um, and thank you guys for for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Let's let's give a round of applause for that very nice talk, virtually or in person. I'm, I'm holding a cell phone, so I'm gonna clap with one hand here. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much. Are there, are there any questions for, uh, for Dr. Rodriguez? Can I ask, uh, with what you just said about the um, increasing too fast is bad when there's competition. Yeah. It's not, I mean, the resources are sort of unlimited, right? In this uh, model? I mean, yeah, the, so the resources, that's, that's right. That's the spatial, spatially inhomogeneous term telling you the concentration of. Yeah, that, that, that M of X is fixed. It's not changing with time. So in, in, do you have any, uh, that, uh, I, I don't have any intuition then. If, I could see if, if resources were limited, then gobbling them up too fast is that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the only that yeah, it's. I mean, it's 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 sort of ca it was counterintuitive to us uh, because you're right. You know, your the population will still survive, right? So you know, it's not it's not a question of the population not surviving. the 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 question is, once you have another species competing, if you're if your population is not matching those resources, they can then overtake, you know, they can outcompete you, or at least they can establish themselves, mm -hmm. right? So it's, again, if you have a single population, that's why I'm saying like moving, like being greedy is fine. You're more likely to survive the faster that you move. You're not gonna match the resources necessarily, but you're going to survive. But when another species comes in, that's when, you know, and, and you know, we, we've, there's still a lot that we need to prove, but at least numerically, right, we can see that even if you start off with way more resources, uh, you're, you're, you're going to survive, but you're going to be very, very small compared mm -hmm. to the populations that were not so greedy. Mm -hmm. You're just, you're opening yourself up to someone else using a better strategy somehow. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and it, it was, yeah, it is, it, it is a little bit counterintuitive because you would think like, 
the, the population get, that gets to the better, you know, the, the maximum resources first would be more likely to, to survive, but that's not really what's, what's happening. Can I ask another question? I think it's maybe one slide before. No, two slides, maybe. This, this equation, what is this called? The, well, without this F of U is the aggregation diffusion. So it's, it's uh, your, um, it's, you know, populations which want to disperse, but also they want, they want to disperse locally. Sometimes you might have like a power law diffusion. So you might have like self diffusion, but they also want to aggregate long range, right? So that's why they're, they're, they're competing factors, but at different ranges. So one is, one is locally, uh, again, you, you may want your sort of personal space, right? Uh, but also you wanna make sure that your population is not totally separated. Um, and yeah. this, is the, this is the gradient, right? So two of these is the Laplacian? This is the gradient, right? So this would be, okay. right, this, this would be- I just be wanted to make sure. Does it kind of look like a, a, like a um, Kuramoto, Shivazinski, but I was thinking these were Laplacians, but they're, they're, they're gradients, so. They're, they're gradients, right? Yeah, okay, so okay. yeah, so this is, this is, if you bring this gradient in, you're advecting the population U with this velocity field um, that is not divergent free. Um, and and so, this is non-local, right? Because that's a convolution. That's right. So what we're saying is Oops. that your your advection is actually non-local. So this is an integral here. Uh -huh. So you're 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 not you're not com you're not deciding where to move depending solely on what's happening here, but rather on what's happening throughout the region, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and there's I mean there's evidence that that different animals actually move based on non-local information because they have memory. They remember that mm -hmm, they saw mm -hmm. a member, you know, like 10 feet in that direction. And so they might want to move in that direction. Are there other questions? This may be a bit of a naive question. Um, but I wonder if there's, there, if you've thought about it, if there's room to, you know, sort of on everyone's mind right now, COVID um, and, and, and variants in particular, um, if, if you thought about using some of these techniques for modeling um, competition for hosts, I, I realize a virus is not exactly an, an agent that um, exhibits a relocation strategy exactly, but um, yeah, I wonder if, if you've thought about modeling a, a spread. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't thought about about it from that perspective. I certainly have thought about it from the perspective of the movement of individuals. Sure. Right? Because the way, you know, the way we move uh, definitely has an effect, right? Um, on, on the spread of the virus. Um, but, you know, I, I, I haven't gone beyond thinking because I think I mean, first of all, these would be way too simplified of a models for the types of like dynamics that should really be analyzed to really say something useful with related to 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 COVID. Um, so I, you sure. know, I think I think there could be some interesting like toy problems there, uh, but I I I haven't really. I feel like everybody is working on COVID modeling. Uh, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. So I haven't, I haven't really like ventured in, in that direction, but I, yeah, that's, that, 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 again, I think there's some potential there. Okay, well, if, if there aren't any other last oh, minute questions. All right, um, can I one more question? Dr. Reed. Sure. Uh, and I, I think my internet is a little unstable, so I apologize if I'm, if I'm going in and out. But would you mind going back to slide 42? I wanted to try to understand the, the second bullet point a little better, you know, sort of dynamically, what is the conjecture? Mm. So there's, yeah. this was like, you're looking at the uh, zero 
and the non-constant equilibrium together, right? Yeah, it's different, right? Like let's there there's a there's a difference between what I the local neighborhood invader. That means I already have an established population, and then you is the one that's following the ideal free distribution strategy. And that starts at a small near the origin or something. Yeah. yeah. The, the evolutionarily stable, that means you is established at an equilibrium. And then if I introduced another population, it does not, it cannot, it cannot invade. And so that would correspond to the stability of U star, you're right, where again, you trying to, it's following the ideal free distribution or actually the resources, I guess, at the resources and then zero for, for B. But so is this a question about where the unstable manifold of the origin goes? Yeah, I mean, uh, but it's not of the origin, right? Because you're not looking at the stability of zero, zero. Okay, right. So it's, the, it, it's, it's like the origin in the uncoupled system for the, but then you couple it and now you have this zero comma V star, this is a new equilibrium. Yeah, well, yeah, for this one, it would be- for The bigger system. M would be M zero. That would be the equilibrium for, for, the, for the bigger system. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you want something to come up out of the origin and go where? Um, in order, I mean, in, in this case, we would be saying that it, again, it's, it would be stable in this case. So it comes out of the- Origin and ends up at a state at a new stable equilibrium. It or no, I mean. So oh, so you're going back to the first equation. So no, so this one would say it would come for the other one. Yes, for the other for the other one. Yes, for this one is it would come back to the origin. Okay, I see. So comes okay. So, but then if it comes out of the origin and it comes back, so you have some instability going on, but how does it come out and come back? How do, what do you require for that? I don't, I don't know by the come back, but what we're saying is that you're, if you're, you're starting close to the origin, you're going to be, you're going to move to the origin. Oh, okay, so okay. It's not really coming out of the origins. You, you start okay. as much as you want, you know, to the origin, but, you know, obviously if you're too far away, this analysis won't work, but if you're close enough to the origin, we're saying you're, you're, you're gonna go back. So you kind of, you want stability, that's like wanting that fixed point to be stable. For this one is stable, for the other one is unstable. So uh -huh. for the other one is again, if no matter how close you are to the origin, you're going to go to another non-trivial equilibrium solution. Mm -hmm. And you said, uh, so you look at these a lot on uh, intervals or squares or what kind of bounded domains? Yeah, so the you know it's it's just been on intervals and squares, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, but you're you're absolutely right that the actual domain now um, really makes uh, probably the next thing to probably like the next easiest thing to do to try to tackle would be sort of like star shaped domains, mm -hmm. uh, but you know again more generally we're we're mostly interested in in, in um, I mean, you, I feel like you can, you could generalize things more easily theoretically in a way than trying to compute on, on different domains. But, um, but yeah, definitely the domain will 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 play a role. But squares and intervals are already interesting. For me, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and even like I said, even in the squares and intervals is not so clear. It's 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 not an easy problem. So, mm -hmm. thanks a lot. No, thank you guys. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Dr. Rodriguez, for for speaking to our group. Um, yeah, we appreciate it. Very nice talk. Thanks again. Thank you.